Hello, can you listen to my voice? Can Sabir tell me on uh, WhatsApp? Can you get my voice? Hello, am I audible? So in the last lecture, we uh, examined about uh, outer structures, face turn, head turn, leads, eyelashes, lead margins, right. Today we will see uh, about something about conjunctiva and further structures, okay. Conjunctival structure has got two parts. One is a bulbar conjunctiva and uh, other part is a uh, uh, palpebral conjunctiva right you can see the inside of the lead conjunctiva is called palpebral conjunctiva while conjunctiva lining the sclera is called vulvar conjunctiva palpebral conjunctiva is firmly adherent while vulvar conjunctiva is movable okay here you can see the palpebral conjunctiva in the upper lid here the upper lid is everted to see the subconjunctiva structures. Conjunctiva itself is a transparent membrane. Whatever you are seeing is underlying vessels and uh, other structures. Color of conjunctiva gives you idea about uh, many uh, systemic problems. If the color of conjunctiva is brownish, uh, it it gives a idea about melanosis or a, in older times people were applying silver nitrate that can also lead to brownish conjunctiva. In glaucoma if you put uh, latanoprost or prostaglandin drops for a very long time the conjunctiva can become brownish. Uh, it can become greenish also if people are using surma application in the eye. Conjunctiva is pale in case of anemia. Conjunctiva can be blue if the cyanosis is there, hypoxia is there. And if you see bright red, uh, it may be due to subconjunctival ha hemorrhage. In conjunctival congestion, the vessels in the conjunctiva and below conjunctiva gets engorged and so it gives rise to superficial congestion and there are two varieties of uh, conjunctival congestion one is a conjunctival congestion which is superficial in nature another one is a ciliary congestion which is somewhat deeper to the conjunctiva we will see the differences you, you, you should you must remember the differences between conjunctival congestion and ciliary congestion because clinically it helps in differentiating various ophthalmic diseases. See here you can say there is a sort of a superficial conjunctival type of congestion mainly peripherally located that means away from limbus. So it's generally commonly because of some irritation, conjunctivitis, foreign body etc. Here also its conjunctival congestion is there which is away from the limbus. Uh, here you can see there is a ciliary congestion. The uh, redness is noted surrounding the limbus. Whenever you see this type of ciliary congestion, it gives a idea about a serious intraocular problem. There are various intraocular problems like say, acute congestive glaucoma, iridocyclitis or corneal ulcer 
all gives rise to ciliary type of congestion. So, whenever you say that there is ciliary congestion, that means some serious eye related condition is going on. But if only conjunctival superficial congestion is there away from limbus, you can say that it can be because of irritation, foreign bodies or conjunctivitis. Here you can see ciliary congestion is there because of corneal ulcer. You can see here central uh, ulcer is there and in other photograph smaller central ulcer is there. In conjunctival congestion difference is you should not. Uh, it is away from uh, limbus while ciliary congestion is at the limbus. Color of conjunctival congestion is bright red while ciliary congestion is somewhat dusky, uh, somewhat uh, dull red you can say, right. The, in conjunctival congestion the vessels are superficial and branching approaching towards limbus while in ciliary congestion vessels are more or less radial straight and radiating from the limbus. Limbus means junction of cornea with the sclera. Cornea with scleral junction is called <coughs> limbus. In conjunctile congestion on moving the conjunctiva congested vessels also move but in ciliary congestion moving the conjunctiva will not move the ciliary congestion. So, that is another difference. In conjunctile congestion if you mechanically squeeze the blood the vessels will slowly fill from the fornix towards limbus while in ciliary congestion the vessel will fill from limbus to fornix that is the reverse difference. In conjunctile congestion if you put a drop of adrenaline the vessels will blanch but in ciliary congestion the vessels will not blanch with adrenaline. So, that is a very important difference. Uh, common causes of conjunctival congestion are acute conjunctivitis, while common cause of ciliary congestion is as I said acute iridocyclitis and corneal ulcer and also acute congestive glaucoma. Sometimes there is mixed congestion is also there, conjunctival congestion as well as ciliary congestion. Uh, you all must remember the differences between conjunctival congestion and ciliary congestion because it will be asked to you in exam also, in theory also and in viva also, right. Another finding in conjunctiva is conjunctival chemosis. Chemosis means edema, edema of conjunctiva. Many a times you might have observed that there is some allergic inflammation in the eye and conjunctiva gets bulged edema develops. So, that is because of fluid accumulation below the conjunctival tissue. Sometimes you find follicles, follicles are nothing but greyish white small pinhead size uh, spots uh, uh, which is in the sub conjunctival space. Typically in the upper lid, when you evert the upper lid you can see the follicles causes of follicle typically commonest cause is trachoma, but sometimes acute follicular conjunctivitis or chronic follicular conjunctivitis uh, you can uh, see the uh, follicles. Papilla, you must remember the difference between follicle and papilla. Follicle is a aggregation of lymphocytes while papilla are aggregation of capillaries. So, a bunch of capillaries aggregate together and it forms a sort of a elevated appearance. So, that is a papilla. Papilla typically occurs in various causes like spring catar. Typical example is spring catar, but sometimes uh, it can occur in trachoma also and other type of allergic conjunctivitis like giant papillary conjunctivitis. Concretions. Sometimes you see conjunctival concretions. Concretions are white hard looking areas. Uh, they are typically 
consisting of calcium deposits into the conjunctiva. Common cause is conjunctival degeneration and very long standing trachoma. Foreign bodies are there. You know, we get many types of foreign bodies and foreign bodies are, uh, you know, gives lots of irritation. And eye is a very sensitive structure. Unless you remove the foreign bodies, uh, you will not get uh, any relief. Uh, you all must remember that commonly the foreign bodies are lodged into upper lid into sub systematically. Uh, was there any problem? Hello, I know some connection issues, you know technology is always, uh, <laughs> we all have to be careful anyway, uh, I will try my best to you know uh, provide you with good connection, I hope you can see here. Uh, so we go to sclera, sclera has got white color but there can be different colors depending upon the underlying condition yellow color you all know whenever we have got jaundice our sclera develops deposition of bilirubin this bilirubin will cause yellowish discoloration of sclera very common very common finding and you all must recognize that there is jaundice sometimes sclera is bluish in color Blue sclera occurs in osteitis, deformance, Marfan syndrome, pseudoxanthoma elasticum. Okay, sometimes brownish pigmentation is there in case of nevus of ota or melanosis bulbi. So many conditions are there, but you should remember that one or two conditions that yellow sclera occurs in jaundice, blue occurs in osteitis, deformance or Marfan syndrome, like this you can remember, okay. Inflammation of sclera, even sclera although is a fibrous, somewhat less vascularized structure, but that can also lead rise to uh, inflammation and it is called scleritis or episcleritis also is there. Here you can see nodule like inflammation is there and uh, it is a episcleritis right and episcleritis has to be differentiated from flictanular conjunctivitis okay uh, here you can see diffuse scleral inflammation is there diffuse scleritis uh, many times in collision disorders this type of uh, inflammation develops and it is suggestive of scleritis. Staphyloma, you know whenever there is some part of sclera which is bulged abnormally compared to its normal uh, position, uh, then it is called as staphyloma. If say some injury is there, perforation of sclera is there, that part of uh, sclera becomes weak and it leads to bulging of sclera, uh, it's called staphyloma. In case of high, I, I, can you say, I think, is it okay? Hello, Samir, can you listen to me? So, staphyloma can be a anterior staphyloma or it can be a posterior staphyloma. Posterior staphyloma typically occurs in case of high myopia. If very high myops are there, they develop bulging of sclera posteriorly and it leads to degenerative changes. 
good samir is saying everything visible oh yeah nice good okay now after examining conjunctiva sclera we should see cornea how the cornea looks like you know microcornea word is there when you can say the cornea is small there should be some criteria when the horizontal diameter of cornea horizontal remember not vertical if less than 10 mm it is called microcornea so typical ocular associations are glaucoma cataract cornea plena leucoma iris abnormalities and associated syndromes are turner syndrome erler danlos weil marchesani or wardenberg syndrome so these people have got smaller cornea or microcornea another word is megalocornea whenever the horizontal diameter is more than 13 mm then you can say that there is megalocornea that means normal diameter horizontal diameter of cornea is 10 to 13 mm in majority of persons there may be age related variations will be there but normal corneal diameter in a horizontal meridian will be 10 to 13 mm now if more than 13 mm these are the systemic conditions one is called marfan syndrome another is apert syndrome erler danlos syndrome down syndrome osteogenesis imperfecta renal carcinoma mental retardation and uh, in buffthelmos glaucoma in children in that also you get megalocornea uh here you know differences between keratoconus keratoglobus and other thing we, you may not remember but two conditions you should remember what is keratoconus and keratoglobus keratoconus means at the central part that is apex of cornea bulging develops in typically in a young persons and the curvature increases so that is called keratoconus keratoglobus means whole cornea tends to bulge more and curvature increases and so that is keratoglobus keratoconus is a, a progressive condition in many young people and it can initially lead to myopia mm, but if it, it if it goes on increasing it can lead to lots of complications in the cornea also nowadays uh, good therapy of keratoconus is available if you are interested you can read uh, more from the books uh, but you should remember what is keratoconus and keratoglobus now cornea you should see the uh, as i said keratoglobus is a whole bulge cornea and keratoconus is a central part of cornea which is bulging uh you can see here in the low uh, side view of cornea uh you can see this one is a keratoglobus the lower photograph is of keratoconus and uh, when you ask the patient to look downward the lower lid gets you know elevated over the conus and it that sign is called munson sign munson munson sign so that is a sign of keratoconus nowadays advanced topography instruments are available with which we can exactly map the structure of corneal curvatures uh, advanced corneal topography machines are available which will map everything where exactly keratoconus is and many types of corneal surgeries with laser excimer laser femto laser Uh, that can be done after doing topography corneal topography many types of refractory error astigmatism can be now treated by applying lasers excimer laser or femto laser or other techniques so 
corneal manipulation is advanced in a such a way that we can treat many conditions nowadays. Uh, the same keratoconus and thysis, sometimes keratocornea plana is there which has got flat curvature of cornea. Transparency of cornea. You know cornea is a transparent structure naturally. It has, it has to remain transparent. Then only we can see. If cornea becomes opaque, we cannot see well. right? So cornea transparency is lost if there is corneal edema, fluid accumulation or because of traumatic some reason opacity develops or if corneal ulcer is developed or if some deposits are there in cornea right all these factors affect the transparency of cornea you know cornea is a avascular structure there are no blood vessels in the cornea if blood vessel starts growing the transparency will be lost so, so cornea gets its nutrition from the limbal capillaries and also aqueous which is circulating into the anterior chamber the, and cornea gets oxygen from directly from the atmosphere also so that is how cornea gets the uh, nutrition uh, corneal here corneal vascularization is shown but you need not uh, go in detail it may be a diffuse vascularization it may be superficial deep in many types of corneal inflammatory condition that is called keratitis uh, corneal vessels grows into the corneal substance and you get opacities and other complications corneal sensation you know corneal is a highly sensitive structure there are lots of nerve endings in the cornea that's why you know if say anything touches to your cornea you immediately close your eye but in some conditions the corneal sensitivity is decreased uh, when it occurs corneal sensitivity is decreased in some conditions called herpetic keratitis neuroparalytic keratitis leprosy diabetes advanced diabetes there then also corneal sensation is decreased and absolute glaucoma all this condition has got decreased corneal sensitivity you can test the sensitivity of cornea by a small cotton pledget take a very small cotton uh, pledget tip and ask the patient to look straight and touch the cornea if there is nice blinking response is there sensitivity is normal but if person is not able to close the eye properly then there is some sensitivity issue is there and this can be because of this neural underlying conditions which i already told you sometimes corneal degenerations are there and commonest degeneration is arcus senilis you can see here in the photograph there is a peripheral annular lipid infiltration of cornea this typically is found in aged person people over 65 70 years of age generally they develop this type of lipid deposits into the periphery of cornea so that is called arcus senilis generally it doesn't cause any problem with the vision because it is located into the peripheral part of cornea now after examining cornea you should see the anterior chamber what is the anterior chamber anterior chamber is a structure bounded anteriorly by cornea peripherally by angle of anterior chamber and posteriorly by iris and part of lens in the pupillary area so this all this space is called anterior chamber posterior chamber means what the space enclosed between lens and iris it is called posterior chamber both this chamber contains aqueous humor aqueous humor is formed by ciliary body it initially comes into the posterior chamber it travels through the pupil and comes into the anterior chamber and in anterior chamber in the peripheral part of anterior chamber 
in the angle of entry chamber the aqueous gets drained into superficial scleral vessels so this process is going on continuously if there is any problem with the this process it can lead to problems so you must check the depth of entry chamber say the distance between cornea and iris that is called depth in the center uh, of entry chamber and you should know how to examine the depth by torchlight and you should be able to designate whether entry chamber is shallow or deep or normal so shallow entry chamber occurs in this many conditions one is a primary narrow angle glaucoma hypermetropia malignant glaucoma perforations are there subluxation of lens is there or swollen intumescent lens is there that is the early stage of cataract right in this conditions shallow entry chamber so you all must remember causes of shallow entry chamber and causes of deep entry chamber that you all must know very well so here are the causes of deep entry chamber that means space is increased in the entry chamber typically between central part of cornea and pupil area you can see deep entry chamber so deep entry chamber occurs in aphakia aphakia means absence of lens whenever there is no lens means aphakia so there is a deep entry chamber if posterior synechia total posterior sign synechia means adhesion if the iris gets adhered to the cornea it is called as anterior synechia if iris gets adhered to the lens it is called posterior synechia very simple right so uh, posterior synechia can lead to deep entry chamber in myopia say somebody is having a high myopia they have got a large eye and so in this large eye the entry chamber is deeper if somebody is having keratoglobus or buphthalmos that is the advanced stage of glaucoma in children it is called buphthalmos so in that also deep entry chamber will be there and keratoconus is naturally uh, keratoconus in this is in the central part of cornea and so deep entry chamber in the central area you can see then there is a dislocation posterior dislocation of lens perforation of globe all this can cause deep anterior chamber uh, normally you know aqueous humor which is present in the anterior chamber is perfectly transparent there are no protein or cells nothing perfectly transparent fluid is there but some diseases can cause uh, opacities in the uh, aqueous and uh, it is called aqueous flare it is due to collection of inflammatory cells and protein particles typically it can occur in iridocyclitis which you can easily examine by slit lamp examination you can see in the photograph uh, slit lamp will is showing you particles in the uh, entry chamber and on surface of lens then one term is called keratic precipitates on the back surface of cornea because of inflammation there are deposits and they are uh, there may be arranged in a triangular fashion uh, from central to inferior part of cornea or throughout cornea typically it occurs in iridocyclitis right if predominant cyclitis is there renilomatous cyclitis then you get triangular posterior corneal deposits or keratic precipitates but if diffuse iridocyclitis there all throughout cornea you can uh, see the deposits so here in this photograph you are able to see the triangular uh, corneal deposits on the back of cornea now after you examine entry chamber cornea now you examine the iris first you see color we are all brown colored iris but in uh, other countries light colored iris are there bluish looking eyes are also there in european races 
uh, but we because of heavy sunlight we have developed brown iris to minimize the sunlight effect inside our eye in iris you should see pattern also you know we have got a typical pattern in the iris ups and downs this all patterns are unique for each and every person that's why you know in your uh, is a biometric uh, identification our eye or iris photograph is taken and this iris photograph can be used as a identity of the person so in biometric you can use the structure of iris to examine a particular person okay synechia as i already told you iris can either to cornea or lens so it is may be called anterior synechia or posterior synechia and uh, uh, this already shown in the photograph there is one term called iris bomb that you should remember if the pupil border of iris adheres to the lens and peripheral part of iris bulges because of you know aqueous stagnation then it is called as iris bomb bomb formation right and forward bulging of iris then another term for iris is iridodonesis that means tremulousness of iris if iris has got no support of lens then it becomes tremulous in, in case of aphekia iridodonesis occurs then another term uh, is called rubiosis iris iridis rubiosis iridis it is called new vessel formation in the iris typically you see rubiosis in diabetes mellitus central retinal vein occlusion and chronic iridocyclitis sometimes you see nodules on the iris surface typically copes nodule busaka's nodule melanoma may be there tuberculoma can be there or in a fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis so nodules you can see on surface of iris all this you can nicely see with the slit lamp if you are attending the iopd you all must see how the slit lamp looks like and how we examine the iris with the help of slit lamp sometimes there is a gap in the iris it is not a perfectly uh, you know mem round membrane like structure uh, in case of coloboma it may be a congenital coloboma right from birth the child is born with iris coloboma you can see in the photograph in both the eyes typically more in left eye the lower part of iris has got defect development defect so it is called iris coloboma we create surgical defect also in the iris as a part of treatment in case of treatment of glaucoma or sometimes in cataract surgery we take we create a hole in the iris you can see in the photograph on the right side an iridia an iridia means loss total absence of iris some children are born without iris they have got lots of problem of photophobia because there is no regulation of light no iris diaphragm or sometimes after trauma also people develop uh, an iridia right <clears throat> now it is you can see the anterior segment structure uh, clearly even if the cornea is opaque you know in many clinical conditions the cornea is opaque so you cannot see the iris and anterior chamber and anything but still you can uh, see these structures with the help of uh, bio microscopy there is b scanning you can see in the photograph b scanning is showing you iris problems uh lens problems how is the angle all that and still further nowadays optical coherence tomography the equipment is there which is light based with which you can exactly see the anatomy of the whole uh anterior segment of the eye this oct is also used to see the macular structure also so you should uh, read somewhere about oct optical coherence 
tomography. Nowadays, it is routinely and extensively used to examine the eye, uh, right? So, we have seen about the examination of eye. Uh, we will take cataract in the next lecture, but here I will show you one uh, video of Kelejion surgery just for your interest. Uh, we will see this. Okay, I think you can make out. The following video uh, demonstrates uh, Cerlasian removal, which is a very common procedure I perform on a day to day basis in my practice. Here you can see the collision. The local is there. infiltrated uh, transconjunctivally uh, into the uh, back surface of the lid to uh, completely uh, anesthetize the area involving the Cerlasian. Uh, the local consists of 1% uh, salicane with 100,000 units of epinephrine uh, buffered with uh, bicarbonate uh, solution. Posterior infiltration is then followed by anterior infiltration through the skin. Approximately a half cc to cc of local is infiltrated uh, anteriorly. Good local infiltration uh, ensures that the uh, patient is comfortable throughout the procedure and it also uh, facilitates uh, cooperation while this uh, procedure is being uh, performed. Following the infiltration of the local anesthetic, the spacing clamp is uh, applied. It is uh, tightened and the eyelid is inverted. And now it is very central, you know. The uh, Salazian the is then um, opened now up for its posterior aspect uh, using a number 11 uh, blade. Uh, Once the uh, Salazian has been opened, uh, a curette is then used uh, to uh, clear out its contents. And uh, a vigorous material curetting of the contents of the uh, Salazian. Uh, will help uh, facilitate the uh, drainage. The Often the uh, granulomatous uh, material uh, requires uh, quite a, a vigorous um, action to uh, completely uh, deflate and clear the Salazian. In this phase of the procedure, I'll often tighten the Salazian clamp as often it becomes loose as the Salazian itself uh, deflates. Again, expression of the uh, granulomatous material within the Salazian um, is aided by the use of a, a, a curette. The Salazian clamp has uh, moved inferiorly in this case, but it's still in an adequate uh, position uh, to proceed with the remainder of the uh, procedure. I will generally uh, perform a small a biopsy uh, taking part of the posterior wall of the uh, tarsal plate. I routinely uh, perform uh, a biopsy of the uh, posterior aspect of the uh, tarsal plate, uh, removing uh, a rectangular piece of uh, tissue with wet Scott scissors as uh, demonstrated uh, here. The specimen is then uh, submitted to pathology. Uh, uh, inspection is made for readers. There are none in this particular instance. The Slazen clamp is uh, removed. Right. I then so, generally apply Tobradex uh, uh, ointment the to the inferior fornix uh, and then apply you know, uh, a pressure uh, dressing, uh, which I have the uh, patient peep on until uh, the following the uh, morning. I will often have them errors, apply ice over the patch uh, off and on uh, during the day. Salazians are uh, quite uh, common, uh, so it is um, important to have an effective uh, method for um, incision and drainage, uh, which uh, ensures uh, patient uh, comfort. More students should get more marks. I will uh, post new quiz on eye examination, and uh, I will I will send the link with uh, Samir. Samir will uh, give it to all of you and uh, I, I expect all of you to get uh, full marks in this quiz. Uh, next lecture uh, we will take on Thursday 5 pm. Thursday evening we will take a lecture. Meanwhile, uh, I would request uh, you to write your uh, you know perceptions. Said this I have taken two lectures. 
uh, what I mean what improvements is required but change I know internet uh, connection issues are there I, I also feel that but I mean exact solutions is, is not available with me also uh, but I will try my best uh, what more should I do that uh, you all should write to Samir Samir will pass uh, a message to me and uh, uh, here anybody has written in the chat Fenil uh, Fenil Ravesh yeah, yes sir good nice so okay guys uh, should we stop now